Trust me. Nothing to it, but to do it. Nathan Yurevichis is an Australian award-winning artist that embodies every expression of the word artist, from publications, galleries, a vinyl toy range, graphic novel, online games, and now an animated feature film. To save her father and the destruction of her planet, Aki must overcome her fears and journey to the fantastical city of light. Scary Girl is in Australian cinemas from October 26th. Nathan, thank you so much and welcome to the Foyer Reference podcast. Thanks so much. It's lovely to be here. It's so nice to be able to chat today and I'm so excited to talk about the film. There's aesthetically there's a lot to talk about, even the themes as well, but I think even before we come to that, I kind of just want to talk about the Scary Girl IP in general. This is a decades-long legacy, you know, that you've had with Scary Girl, you know, going from 2D to game animation to a feature film. I would love to know living in the world and in the IP and in the characters, did you feel like there was more to learn about Aki in the world? Yeah, absolutely. There was, there's always been different stories being told through the different mediums. Mm -hmm. uh, and with this film, there was, uh, it was a new story. It, I hadn't actually told this, this story before um, because we didn't really know a lot about um, her exact journey from other mediums it was always uh you know it was a silent graphic novel so there wasn't words yeah. uh the game had a different kind of focus and so this film is is really a uh a new take on the story and it's an, and a new take on uh even her aesthetically she's she's actually quite different looking to what she was you know 21 years ago so there was there's a new there was new stories and i think there's a lot more stories to tell of her as well you know she's you're only touching the surface of exactly where she came from and, and are we getting a uh, cinematic universe maybe 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 <laughs> yeah yeah no there's, there's definitely there's definitely kind of a, a multiverse style thing that's going on here and and you'll see that like each one um has its own take it, i always look at it as a, a bit of a um how would you put it uh an open source type story where mm. collaborators come in and they reinterpret the story based on a very sort of thin thread of what needs to happen. But after the, the thin thread is kind of uh, essentially tied up, the the contributor can you know, kind of go anywhere they want on it as yeah, far yeah. as, you know, this character's now bad, this character's good, uh, maybe we'll <laughs> do this twirly. halfway through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's interesting that you say open source because eventually I do want to talk about the themes um, in Scary Girl and, you know, the whole machine versus nature um, sort of conversation. So I guess that's just a little tantalising um, on the way in our chat. But I think before we get to that, I think what impressed me the most was how visually delicious this film was. You know, it had such a visual language to it from the colours to the textures and the way that the film was layered and, you know, even the different sort of worlds that we would have inside of Scary Girl had a different sort of colour aesthetic. I want to talk a little bit about, I guess, the visual language and the journey into translating that into an animated film. Yeah, I mean, with the with the world of Scary Girl, I, I do like to kind of, I suppose, pocket each environment with a very specific uh like color palette mm -hmm. uh, and especially with the film the film is really broken up i would say into kind of three color palettes you have the the, the peninsula where things are are quite um i suppose non-machine like uh then you've got the the forest area which is quite a it's like a combination between the city and the uh the peninsula as far as kind of the, the atmosphere of of being a little bit more grungier, darker. Yeah. And then you've got the city atmosphere, which is a very kind of blues and purples, uh, which is quite a contrast between the peninsula. And so yeah. looking at the world, you can kind of, um, if you look at the movie on a almost like a timeline, it you can see the quite the strong progression of of the colours of it being kind of sort of sort of sunny to kind of this really kind of purpley bluey environment mm -hmm. and what's interesting is that the sun is also being affected during the film so as mm -hmm. the sun gets affected the sky is actually becoming red and so when you look outside you'll actually see over the course of the film a, a redness to the sky which affects the interiors of the city as well and so you're getting this really lovely 
kind of, um, I suppose, ominous red tones hitting all the characters once we get to the city. And then that changes at the very end when the sun is back to its yeah. sort of almost good state. So it's a really it's really interesting to kind of break up the worlds in a in colors uh, uh-huh. colors come fairly naturally and I, I love um uh kind of breaking up all my work into kind of very specific color palettes mm-hmm. um yeah because it's it, it's so interesting is it a conscious thing though because I imagine you know artists just close their eyes and then they just paint around and <laughs> it, it just yeah. automatically creates it that way or is it more of a methodical like how was it being able to be like, this world is this, this world is that. Was it more methodical or was it more free-flowing? For the film, it there was definitely a, a method to it. It was, a, I mean, a lot of my um, work that I do normally as a, just as an artist is more free-flowing, mm-hmm. um, but but often there's a focal point. So with, with the, the film, uh, I do have a very specific kind of color focal point, and so yeah. we will break up the the film in that way. So, you know, with uh, with the city, for instance, we were always looking at um, kind of blue tones and red tones as the as kind of like the key colors to that city, and so everything was kind of based around that that color palette for the city. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, for the, for the peninsula, we're looking at kind of a lot more earthy tones. So there's you know there's lovely browns and kind of greens that you actually don't really see much in the city yeah. at all and so it's a real contrast and and we had to be specific because in order f- to show the contrast between the worlds and how the world was getting more affected the closer you got to technology the wow. further away from technology <laughs> it became more natural I also love because, uh, you know, all cultures around the world or even just in general, this sort of sedentary sort of life that we have, people crave the sun, people crave being out into nature. And that really played a really core cool theme. And I really appreciated that um, in Scary Girl. I-, I think, you know, talking about the texture and, you know, even the mood and the tonality of Scary Girl, um, it was really underscored, if you'll pardon the pun, by the sound design. And also mm. the score in the film. What was it like working towards the mood and the tone, and I guess even the plot throughout the film? Of we visually have it. How do we, um, I guess, add that extra sort of seasoning through the sound? Yeah, I mean, the sound is one of my favorite aspects of the film. Uh, the, I mean, the sound design, the music. I mean, Ak, the the composer. Uh, was brilliant. Like he, we, we had a kind of a brief for him that we wanted to kind of bring about throughout the different, um, you know, areas of the film. Uh, and he was able to kind of interpret those areas uh, through various mood boards that we'd done. And it, there's a lot of um, nature and kind of hand-built sounds that come into the uh, the peninsula and the, uh, and the forest as well. So yeah. When you listen to it, you can kind of, kind of the brief to to Ak was like, imagine uh, the Scurry Girl world had a, has its own band. What would they? What instruments would they play? Yeah. Uh, what uh, what natural objects would you find in that environment that could be used as instruments? And so, uh, th- the composer really took that to heart and and brought that sound and sound design into the into the different. Uh, musical uh beats throughout the film mm-hmm. um and then as it gets more machine like it, it becomes more synth based yeah uh, there's a lot more of that kind of uh beautiful i suppose 80s retro vibe that comes into it and then when there's a crossover between nature and the machine world what act did is he brought in some of the natural music sounds and then mm-hmm. overlaid them with the the synth and so you had this really lovely merging of technology and nature in the sound design it sounds like a very cohesive team. Like I, I love the way you were able to play together and um, really, cause it really does come out um, in Scary Girl, especially for myself as, you know, as well as audiences in general. Scary Girl is, you know, probably most targeted towards younger audiences, but there's still enough for, you know, adults to be able to watch and be able to digest in different sort of levels as well. What was it like? Because you also talked about how the graphic novel was silent. So I guess, you know, even bringing motivations of characters to create an animated film and that sort of thing. What was it like balancing story, making sure that it had enough obstacles, but also making sure it could resonate on all levels, including younger audiences? 
Yeah, it's a really interesting one with the story because it is definitely focused at a at a younger audience, and it's mm-hmm. probably the first time that I've done something uh, that's more for that kind of you know say six to ten, six to eleven year old audience. Uh, so there's a lot of themes that can resonate with that uh, that younger crowd. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was an interesting process because you know how much, how I suppose. Uh, you know, dark, do we make this, you know, do we kind of bring in this kind of real um, menacing aspect or do we have to kind of like make that more subtle mm-hmm. where adults can kind of understand that this is actually quite a, like a, a scary moment, but it's not so much so scary that a kid will, uh, you know, freak out and want to run out of the the room. Yeah. So it's, it's doing that fine balance. And I mean, the writers did a, did a good job of balancing it. And it's hard, it's very tricky. It's very tricky when you're trying to make something that's it's an indie film, uh, so you don't necessarily have so much of the restrictions of a studio picture. Mm-hmm. But it's also an indie film, and we want an audience as well. So you've got that whole thing of like we don't want it to be so obscure and so weird that you know only a small percentage will ever enjoy yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, on their little so, letterbox like review. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's so hard. So you know, story is really it's a it's a difficult uh one i mean I, I mean most of my concentration on the film was production design and uh you know character design uh but of course you know being a, a very small very tight group of um people making it you know you had to kind of do multiple roles and and mm-hmm. review things and um yeah the story was something that uh you know morphed over the time of making the film as well you know there was yeah. certain things you know that happened at the end of the film even even the resolution of what happens to dr maybe at the end wasn't like was still being worked out because there was one option or there was another option and yeah did we, did we want to think about whether dr maybe has a life beyond the film and you know that was the decision that we went through was yeah like no, the let, hand coming out of the grave yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly so we kind of wanted to give him that you know no there could be a story about dr maybe later on let's mm-hmm. not let's not kind of like eradicate that character from the film. So there was a lot of thought about future future stories being told from this film. Um, we kind of already touched on it, but I guess if you wanted to add some extra comments, there was the talking about environmentalism and I was like, oh, did we do a capitalism as well? And it's like <laughs> machines versus nature and I guess that talks about like the textures and also animations as well, Hayao Miyazaki, you know, 2D, um, you know, the the Oppenheimers of it all with, you know, as practical as possible. Um <laughs> Is there anything in regards to, I, I guess, the layering of, and even sort of parenthood as well, is there anything in the layering of the themes that um, you, you felt like you were able to put into there? Because I, I personally, I think this film achieved what a lot of younger geared sort of films don't do. It was able to achieve so much. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, as far as uh, story and themes go, I think the biggest thing for me and the most personal was the, the family aspect, the, the idea of like, you know, what is your family? Like, do they have to actually be, you know, blood related to be family? Uh, you know, is, is family, you know, essentially kind of what you make of it? Is it who, who actually, you know, brings you up and loves you? Mm-hmm. Um, and also understanding expectations of being say a parent with a kid, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I've got, three kids that are you know grown up now they're in their you know 20s now but they're um you know as a parent you kind of want them to go a certain direction even though you don't specifically say you must be this in your head you're always kind of got these hopes and dreams for your children yeah, yeah. and that plays out a lot in the film where it's kind of like you know what what does a what does a parent want for their kid and they think they've got the potential for and sometimes you don't listen to your kids what they actually want and what they're actually uh uh, skilled at, and yeah. you know, um, and I think Scary Girl really brings that about, where you've got you know this you know young girl who's like actually got skills, but it doesn't go, it goes against what the parent yeah. wants, yeah, and it's not a, it's not even a bad thing that what the parent wants. I mean, what the kid wants, it's just that it's not what the parent. That conflict, yeah, 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 yeah. the conflict, and so you know, you, I think that's a really good, um, it's a really interesting theme to think about as a mm-hmm. parent. And uh, and that plays out a lot in the film, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's things where sometimes you have to take the best bits 
of of a bad situation sometimes you know yeah um i'm going to wrap up with our final question um i'm so sad we didn't get to talk about the casting and the voice actors Jillian Nguyen, Remy He, Rob Collins, Deborah Mailman, Mark Cole Smith, <laughs> and Sam Neill. Like, we don't have time, but I just needed to do a baby shout out. Um, we finish off our reviews with a recommendation. So, what would you pair with Scary Girl as a double feature? I mean, I love uh, James and the Giant Peach, the stop oh. motion film uh, with, uh, by Henry Selleck. Brilliant. I think those two films would work wonders as a double feature. Gorgeous. Love that. Thank you so much, Nathan. I really appreciate your time. Lovely to speak to you too. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you so much. No worries. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.